hello, hello, and hi, 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 and welcome once again to another Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show that we do every two weeks here on our YouTube channel and on all of our audio platforms, where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, the past, the present, their years together, the solo years, and... Um, Anything we feel like talking about. The news is a big part of our show, so it's an all-encompassing show on the Fab Four. I'm Ken Michaels. Hopefully you're aware of the other shows that I have uh, on the internet and even on good old terrestrial radio. I do a syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, heard on about 50 radio stations. I also have another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's also bi-weekly. I have my own YouTube channel, which is loaded with Beatles content called Ken Michaels Radio, and my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, which has lots of interviews on there with Beatle people and uh, Beatles trivia contests all the time. I'm being joined by my two regulars. First of all, a man who just recently celebrated 40 years on New York's WFUV, and he just celebrated his 59th birthday as well. He is a devoted New York Mets fan, even more devoted than I am. <laughs> I, what makes you say that? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. You have all kinds of Mets garb that you wear. And uh, sometimes it's a miracle when we can take him away from City Field to do this show. But uh, <laughs> he really should work for the Mets organization. Yeah. It's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. And let's go Mets. And be late we should pay you for promoting them. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, birthday was... Uh, when was my birthday? This past weekend. 23rd. Okay. 23rd of March. Wait till you get to 60. Don't want to. But that'll be next year. <laughs> And Alan Cozen, of course, is with us. You know him for being one of the two authors, along with Adrian Sinclair of the McCarty Legacy Volume 1, which is right behind him at all times. Everywhere he goes, he carries that book with him. And Volume 2 comes out the end of this year, fingers crossed. And uh, also, he is the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, worked for many years with the New York Times, in their classical department and is a freelance writer you never know where his articles are going to turn up hi alan hello ked hello darren hello, everyone. hello alan on today's show we're going to be catching up because um as we mentioned uh in our last few shows um the month of january and the first half of february we needed uh alan as well as adrian sinclair to take some time to finish up uh, the McCartney Legacy Volume 2. So there were a lot of shows that we missed in the interim that we planned on doing. Um, as you know, back in November, along with Now and Then being released, the first new Beatles song since Real Love, um, the Red and the Blue collections came out and they were remixed as we have them right here. And at the very beginning of February... Uh, in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Band on the Run, this version came out, which also had a disc on there called the Underdubbed Mix. So, I figure, let's cover all three releases here on this show. When it comes to the remixes for the Beatles, really no need to go into all the stuff that's already been remixed that's come out from Sgt. Pepper on, actually from Revolver on. But we'll talk about the other mixes, especially on the Red Album, and uh, like I said, been on the run 50th anniversary as well. But before we do that, we have the latest Beatle news to get to. First of all, let me just say, we've been giving you the release date for the McCartney Legacy Volume 2 as December 10th, which is where it stands at the moment. But I'm happy to say that you can now pre-order the book on Amazon. In fact, it became the number one new release for rock books on Amazon's list. Congratulations, yes. Alan. Notice how I made that the number one news item here. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> There's a lot to cover, but I made yours number one, Alan. 
On Paul McCartney's own YouTube page, he has posted a live BBC in concert show from 1973 of Paul and Wings in Newcastle. Songs featured include Soily, Big Barn Bed, When the Night, Seaside Woman, Wildlife, Little Woman Love, Maybe I'm Amazed, My Love, Live and Let Die, The Mess, High, 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 and Long Tall Sally. Not the best of sound quality. And it certainly sounds a bit sped up, but interesting that, that it's on the actual McCartney YouTube page. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke for giving me that information. Paul will be performing for a tribute concert for Jimmy Buffett taking place April the 11th at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles to be called Keep the Party Going, a tribute to Jimmy Buffett. There'll be a star-studded cast along with Paul, including the Eagles, Jackson Brown, John Bon Jovi, Zach Brown, Randy Carlyle, Kenny Chesney, Sheryl Crow, and others. Tickets for the show went on sale on uh, March the 15th through Ticketmaster. Congratulations goes out to Sean and to Yoko, both executive producers for War Is Over, inspired by the music of John and Yoko, which won an Oscar for Best Animated Short Film. Filmmakers Dave Mullins and Brad Booker took the stage alongside Sean, who noted Yoko's recent 91st birthday, and with Mother's Day being that day in the UK, whereas we celebrate it in May, he wished his mother a happy Mother's Day and asked the audience to say happy Mother's Day, Yoko, which they all did. Very nice. Very happy for, for Sean and Yoko. And uh, let's kind of hope that, that, that the animated film is somewhere where we can all watch it so we can comment about it. Um, dumb question. Yeah. Uh, something like that, the Winds in the Cat, where could you have seen it already? In other words, it's winning an award. It must be, you know, out there somewhere, right? Or am I, or am I living I under a film festival? But I'm not sure which one. Might have been like Tribeca or something like that. Okay. It is out there on the web. Um, it, I don't believe it was on YouTube itself, but um, someone posted a version of it that um, I ran into a few weeks ago. It's an interesting film. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of similar to the tug of war video in the sense that it's about, you know, people on both sides of a war, uh, you know, meeting in a moment of peace. And what, what, what they've done is they don't want it identifiable as any two particular countries. You know, mm -hmm. so you, you can't tell from the uniforms what they are. And I mean, they're animated anyway. And and so it's two guys uh, in their separate trenches on their side of the, of the of the line playing chess. And they have a carrier pigeon taking the moves to each other. Mm -hmm. And then there is sort of a charge and both sides are fighting and... Um, the two people playing chess who've never seen each other sort of come to, uh, you know, face to face and they realize who they are because someone, I think someone shoots the carrier pigeon and, or, or um, I think they take the, the, the old papers with the moves. One of them takes it out of his pocket and, and the other recognizes it. And, uh, but the, the carrier pigeon gets shot, which is sad. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it, it's it's like that. It, it, eventually it goes into Happy Christmas War is over. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's an unusual short. It's it's nicely done. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad they won a prize. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, you referring to the Pipes of Peace. Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> you meant the Pipes of Peace video, not the Tug of War video. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Um, something interesting. You, you probably are aware of this. Mark Knopfler has put together a star-studded cast of 54 great guitarists for a charity single uh, to record his song called Going Home, the theme from Local Hero. This is to raise funds for Teenage Cancer Trust and Teen Cancer America. Some of the guitarists on uh, on this recording are Eric Clapton, Pete Townsend, Slash, Dave Gilmore, Tony Iommi, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Joe Walsh, Ronnie Wood, Steve Lukather, Peter Frampton, 
Joan Jett, and many more. Um, the artist is being listed as Mark Knopfler's Guitar Heroes. And most notably, the song opens with the last recorded guitar track by Jeff Beck. Now, Paul McCartney is not on this recording, but Ringo is drumming on it, as is his son, Zach. And Roger Daltrey, who happens to be a Teenage Cancer Trust honorary patron and the co-founder of Teen Cancer America with Pete Townsend, uh, plays harmonica for the song. Sting plays bass. The artwork for the single is done by um, Peter Blake, actually. Um, and it's very much in Sgt. Pepper style. Uh, the song was released on March the 15th, and it's available as physical versions on CD, deluxe CD, Blu-ray, and vinyl. Funds will benefit the Teenage Cancer Trust and Teen Cancer America, and uh, the, it's available to order through Mark, Mark Knopfler's Guitar Heroes website. If you go to YouTube, you can watch the new video for this, and you don't see any of these musicians uh, in the video but you do see like a wave file every time a guitar gets played and it tells you who's playing it it's really cool there's so many guitarists on this track and they made note of each single every guitar line which guitar player it is and where Ringo comes in and where Zach comes in so uh, if you're interested interested please check that out okay you know um, at least two of the guitarist Gilmore and Townsend were in Rockestra. If I were producing this, since this is the same idea as Rockestra in a, in a way, hmm. I would have made sure that Paul turned up for one thing, and I would have recorded the Rockestra theme as the B-side <laughs> with all those players. That's what I would have done. Anyway. Yeah, well, you with all your clout would definitely be able to to get Paul on board. Yeah, right. Uh, book News just released on paperback is a new book called 55 Iconic Beatles Songs Discussed by Celebrated Musicians by Frederick Ullmanhorst. Certain artists, including Phil Collins, Michael Jackson, Eddie Van Halen, Frank Sinatra, Mick Jagger, Brian May, Pat Metheny, Sting, and others, share their recollections, insights, and stories about their favorite Beatles songs. And you can enjoy surprising facts about who likes which Beatles song and why. Hmm. Okay, that just uh, has come out. A new book called All You Need Is Love, The Beatles in Their Own Words, unpublished, unvarnished, and told by the Beatles and their inner circle, comes from two familiar names, Peter Brown and Stephen Gaines. Brown was the former COO at the Beatles company, Apple. Uh, the book is comprised of interviews that were done for the book called The Love You Make, which they collaborated on, came out in 1983. Um, these interviews, or oh, that book, only included a small portion of all the material collected. The authors conducted interviews with Paul, Yoko, George, Ringo, wife Cynthia, Maureen, and Patty, as well as major social and business figures in the Beatles' inner circle. This book comes out April 9th. Hmm. Okay. Should prove to be interesting. A lot of the material that wasn't in The Love You Make. Another book coming out this year is called Off the Ground, Paul McCartney in the 1990s by J.R. Moores. Amazon describes it as a sympathetic but clear-eyed exploration of Paul McCartney's work in the 1990s, arguably his most important since the rise of the Beatles. That book is due out November the 12th. Okay. Um, another book I wanted to talk about here. Oh, actually, the um, Mind Games book, which will accompany, which is meant to accompany the box set. The box set is due out in June, but um, there is a delay in, uh, in the book. It's a coffee table size book. Um, it's being delayed until September 24th. And... Uh, and the box set is still a June release. Okay, also, expect the new Beatles book coming in a few months from Terry Crane, who is best known for putting out the book NEMS and the business of selling Beatles merchandise in the U.S., 1964 to 1966. 
That was in 2019. The new one is called Copywriting the Beatles. Now, Terry says the task of documenting Beatles and Beatles-related copyrights is a daunting one. Um, and he says that he has assembled as detailed a book as possible. It chronicles over 900 Beatles and Beatles-related copyrights from 1963 to 66 in the annals of the Library of Congress. Um, there are Beatles and Beatles-related copyrights for musical screenplays, lectures, spoken word writings, dolls, Beatles records, newspaper artwork, paintings, drawings, articles, toys, posters, albums, sculptures, jewelry, portraits, on and on it goes, even cover versions of Beatles songs. Um, this reference publications details the copyrights in chronological order, making it easy to follow the growth of, uh, as Terry says, this wild and wacky genre. Just when you thought there's nothing left to write about on the Beatles, yeah. this is one area that hasn't been explored. And uh, this looks like it's going to be one exhaustive study. 900 copyrights. You never know. Gotta get him on, on this show. What's that? <laughs> you never know when you need to look up something like that. Yeah, that's very true. Luca Parassi, our good friend who put out this book. Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas, The Stories Behind the Songs, Volume 1, 1970 through 1989, has been working on Volume 2. I just did an interview with him where he said the book is finished, but he's waiting for Paul's next album to come out. <laughs> and that's when Volume 2 will come out. But in the meantime, he's just released a book on Band on the Run, which so far has only come out in Italy. Uh, but the English version should be coming out in just a few weeks okay um something you may not have heard about but according to music tap bmg will be releasing a deluxe edition of the compilation let it roll the songs of george harrison the music found on the collection will be from the 2009 remaster but the new version will have a 28 page booklet with liner notes and it's packaged in a four panel digipack the song list is exactly the same no bonus tracks, but it's uh, nice to know that this release is being reissued. And the release date for that is April the 26th. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke for this information. Surprised that's not going to be like a record store day thing because it's six days after record store day. So close in time, I'm really surprised. Anyway, but you also have the other Harrison releases with Wonder right. Woman in electronic sound some major passings we have to note first of all there's johnny gentle um who was born john askew in liverpool in 1936 he will best be known for having the beatles then known as the silver beatles as his backup band for a tour of scotland for seven shows from may the 20th through the 28th in 1960 and this was arranged by concert promoter Larry Parnes. It was the Beatles' first professional tour. At the time, they consisted of John Paul George, Du Sutcliffe, and drummer Tommy Moore. And they were each paid 18 pounds per week. It was only a week for the whole tour. It was on this tour that the Beatles adopted stage names. Paul was Paul Ramone. George was Carl Harrison. John was Long John. And Stu was Stuart DeSteele. The name of the group wasn't even listed in the publicity for the tour. It was simply Johnny Gentle and his group. It was not a pleasant experience for the Beatles, a poorly arranged set of dates. And on May 23rd, Gentle, perhaps having a little too much alcohol, drove their van carrying the group from Inverness to Fraserburg into the back of a stationary Ford Popular, shaking up two elderly women in the car. But a guitar flew right into Tommy Moore's face and he had to be taken to a hospital and that night sedated in bed with a concussion and losing several front teeth John Lennon hauled him out of bed insisting that he play on stage behind his drum kit Larry Parnes helped Johnny get a record contract in 1959 with Phillips Records and gave him the stage name of Johnny Gentle he released two singles and an EP, which proved to be unsuccessful. Another three singles followed, again with no success. 
While on the tour with the Beatles, Johnny reportedly wrote a song that John Lennon helped him finish called I've Just Fallen for Someone, in which John is said to have written the bridge. Uh, the song was released by Adam Faith for his second album, and Johnny recorded the song under a new stage name, Darren Young. Released it as a single on Parlophone Records in 1962, again with no success. Actually, John's name wasn't even given a credit in the songwriting. He later joined the Viscounts in 1964. In 1998, he wrote a book called Johnny Gentle and the Beatles' First Ever Tour, and he made occasional appearances at Beatle conventions. Johnny Gentle died on February 29th at the age of 87. Mm. Still an important figure in Beatle history because of the first professional tour that the Beatles were ever involved with. Backing him. Also, Tony Clark has passed away. He started working at Abbey Road in 1964, later becoming a senior engineer and producer. He worked with the Beatles, Paul and Wings, Cliff Richard, Olivia Newton-John, and Fella Cootie. And uh, when Paul says, take it, Tony, at the beginning of Mumbo, he is referring to Tony Clark. Did you have? Did you ever get to interview Tony for we, the McCartney Legacy? We did, and uh, we included some of the interview in Volume One. And and I, uh, he comes back into the story later, so he'll be in Volume uh, Volume Three, I think. I don't think he's in Volume Two, um, but yeah, we did. Oh, okay. I know we also worked on Red Rose Speedway. Mm -hmm. and uh press to play <clears throat> yeah did you get to talk to or did adrian adrian oh, okay yeah all right and um also it, it still is a tremendous shock to me the loss of eric carmen uh, many beatle fans are fans of eric's work with the raspberries and his solo career um born in cleveland ohio he was a classically trained uh, pianist and a self-taught guitar player with the raspberries he scored major hits like go all the way i want to be with you let's pretend and overnight sensation as a solo artist a blockbuster hit for him in 1976 with all by myself based on rachmaninoff's piano concerto number two yeah. never gonna fall in love again she did it change of heart personal favorite of mine Hungry Eyes from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack, Make Me Lose Control. He also co-wrote the song Almost Paradise from the Footloose soundtrack, which was a top 10 hit for Ann Wilson and Mike Reno. Plus, he wrote two major hits, both top 10s for Sean Cassidy. Yeah. That's Rock and Roll and Hey Deanie. Uh, the Beatles' influence can certainly be heard in Eric's music, along with the Beach Boys and the Who. I know Eric has always cited those three. Musician and writer for Beatle fan magazine Ken Sharp wrote a biography on the Raspberries released in 1993 called Overnight Sensation, the story of the Raspberries. And in the year 2000, Eric was a member of Ringo Starr and his all-star band. And uh, Eric recalled, quote, I had met Ringo various times in the past when I heard he was going to do another tour and he wanted to know if I was interested in doing this. I was so thrilled. This tour consisted of Ringo on drums, Jack Bruce on bass, Dave Edmonds on guitar, and Simon yeah. also co-drumming with Ringo. Carmen said, you have a Beatle, a member of Cream, and Dave Edmonds, who is one of my favorite guitarists and producers. What else can I say? I can't imagine saying no to a Beatle. The Raspberries united for a mini tour in 2005. I got to see them at B.B. King's in New York for that, and I interviewed Eric and their drummer, Jim Bonfanti. Um, in 2017, Omnivore Records released a live album from the Raspberries called Pop Art Live, taken from their reunion concert in 2004 from Cleveland's House of Blues. Apart from their Raspberries material, they also covered the Beatles songs Babies in Black, No Reply, and Ticket to Ride. On March the 11th, Eric's wife Amy announced that Eric passed away in his sleep over the previous weekend and no cause of death was given. Eric Harmon was 74. I always loved his music, loved the raspberries. You couldn't help but notice the Beatles' influence in songs like Go All the Way and I Want to Be With You and Let's Pretend, especially. And um, 
love the hits that he had in his solo career and uh especially his first solo album with all by myself were you aware alan of the rachmaninoff uh connection and all by myself yeah you kind of can't miss it it's the melody you know but yeah yeah it, and, and it often comes up in those lists that people sometimes put together of uh you know rock songs inspired by classical pieces of, of which there are a bunch you know over the years so and that's that's a that's usually pretty high on the list yeah well if you had seen Ringo and the All-Stars, Eric performed all by myself. There's no way he couldn't do that song. But that was also one of the long songs in the set, and Ringo left the stage during that. Mm -hmm. But he did the full version of All By Myself, which has a you know long solo right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. And he played it beautifully. That's how it is on the record. The single was cut real short, yeah. so you never would have heard that part. But you right. would have been really impressed by Eric's piano playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about this, Darren? Yeah, I mean, Eric Carmen was an interesting individual because it seemed like he always seemed to fly under the radar. You read back, well, you were just reading back all of the hits that he had. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them in my head, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yet, um, somebody who's a, who's a casual music fan um, won't know who Eric Carmen is, quite possibly. Uh, yet he's amassed this pretty impressive resume. And of course, the Raspberries, one of the great power pop groups of all time. And yeah. they did it, what, just four albums, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, right. I think they did four studio records. Definitely yeah. three. I think it was four. And uh, yeah, I mean, not not the best description, but the Mount Rushmore of power pop bands, Badfinger, Big Star raspberries mm -hmm. um in my book so yeah that was sad news to hear about eric carmen coming right on the heels of finding out about the next i think the next individual you're going to talk about yeah well i also wanted to mention it all by myself it's so beatly <laughs> yeah and the guitar solo is so george harrison you know right it must have been intentional for it to sound like a george harrison solo which Hugh McCracken played. It's I, like, and I would wonder, I, Bad Finger, I'm sure, didn't set out to sound like the Beatles, but they were from England, the Liverpool connections there, Apple, even if there weren't connections, your ear it might pick up on some singing Apple spinning around on your turn turntable. I don't think Big Star did, Raspberries did. They were definitely Beatles devotees. Um, um, and so much of what they did is influenced by that, especially that mid sixties, uh, rubber soul revolver period. Um, so, and then, and then reinvented himself and had a nice little career as a hit maker, Eric Carmen. So, yeah, Bedfinger not only has the Apple connection, but you know, Paul helped them out with Come and right. Get. Harrison produced a few of the songs on Straight Up. So, uh, yeah. But definitely, every time you get a group like that, where you've got several lead singers and several songwriters, which is the minority in most bands, really, <laughs> um, and they each get a chance to sing their own songs, there'll be some kind of comparison made to sure. the people. Anyway, you know, I was so upset about Eric Carmen that I didn't even realize that it was like a day apart that Carl Wallinger died. And um, I know a lot of Beatles fans enjoyed his music with World Party. And he was also in uh, the Water Boys before that. But um, I just remember my early years in radio hearing Ship of Fools and thinking that's one of the greatest songs <laughs> to me um although i think carl sounded a bit like mick jagger on the song but i know that there's a lot of uh beatle fans that that love his catalog so um yeah uh you're the one it's definitely a very beatle -y song mm -hmm. but um did you follow his career closely darren um yeah especially starting with the second album goodbye jumbo 
Mm. because uh, put the message in the box right. and uh, way down now were are probably two of my favorite world party songs. Uh, I mean, from FUV, um, we played the water boys a lot. Uh, but who knew who this guy Carl Wallinger is on the back cover of uh, uh, their album, This Is The Sea. Um, and then a couple of years later, World Party emerges and you find out, oh, okay, he's the guy from the Water Boys. Um, and the Water Boys, uh, a guy named Mike Scott's band, pretty much. Mike Scott was the driving force behind the Water Boys, still is today. Uh, so Carl Wallinger was there. And I think Mike Scott, uh, appreciated uh, Carl Wallinger's talents and understood why Carl Wallinger needed to leave the Water Boys because he had his own, you know, plans of doing his own thing, and he was he was probably going to always be hidden or at least somewhat blocked by Mike Scott's shadow and the Water Boys. So Carl went off, and he became World Party and. Uh, I think by the third album, World Party had become a bit more of a traditional band where he had a couple of people that he uh, played with all the time. The first two albums, I think, definitely the first album, it was kind of a one-man band situation. The third album was Bang, and then he put out Egyptology, and I believe Dumbing Up was the last album. I had the opportunity to interview him on FUV when Egyptology came out. Um, which was the fourth album. Again, I'm going on memory, I think so, from World Party. And he was a great guy. It was a funny interview because World Party were playing Urban Plaza. And if anyone knows Urban Plaza uh, or knew Urban Plaza in New York City, um, downstairs were the, um, were the bathrooms. We couldn't find a good location to conduct our interview. So we had it in the lounge of the ladies' room, uh, which was pretty funny because there was a lot of toilet flushing that needed to be cut out uh, <laughs> where we could uh, because they had a nice couch, a really nice lounge outside the ladies' room. Uh -huh. Boys don't get these things in the men's room. <laughs> um, and we did the interview there, and it was great. And then I met him at the state at WFUV at least one other time after that. He had suffered from um, uh, brain aneurysm. Sometime around 2000 or 2001, and he was out of commission for years. I think he had to re have relearn how to do a lot of things. Hmm. He put out a, a, a compilation, a big box set for ar archaeology, I think, or I forget the exact name of it. He never did anything new, and I never quite got the story down on why we really never heard from him or World Party again after that. But um, I have a picture I need to put on Facebook that somebody sent me when he came to FUV uh, after I interviewed him, when he just came by, somebody else interviewed him. And I think it was the time he came by after he was sick. And uh, he looked great, and he was talking about new music. And uh, just to my knowledge, it never happened. But he's one of these, and like Eric Carmen, maybe not quite as big of a name as Eric Carmen, but an impressive resume and definitely worth exploring. Um uh, there was a best of album that came out. I didn't even know it came out a few years ago that I just bought a CD copy of, uh, which does a nice job in summing up um, the best of world party in one disc. So, hmm. uh, but if Google that, look for that online somewhere, eBay, Amazon. But uh, yeah, so sad news. And he was young, 66. Something like that. I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Whatever I've heard from him, especially on the radio, I've enjoyed. He's someone that I wanted to I wanted to explore his music more, but he's been on a lot of Beatle fans' radar for many yeah. years. Very sad news. Is it like today's another great song? I think that was on Bang album. Uh -huh. Their album. Anyway. Yeah. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
All right, so let's get to our main topics of conversation, looking at the remixes of the Red and the Blue album and also the underdub mix for Band on the Run. We're going to start with the Red album. And um, when we first heard about the Red and the Blue being remixed, I think I was really surprised. Most of us were kind of expecting the next in the series of archival box sets like Rubber Soul to come out. But... Um, were you excited to learn about the Red and the Blue being remixed? Even though so many of the songs on on uh, the Blue album especially had already been remixed, and you've also got the Revolver tracks on the on the Red album. But what was your initial reaction when you heard about the Red and the Blue coming out this way? And that now and then was going to be included on the Blue album. Alan? Um, I wasn't particularly excited because, as you know, from my point of view, compilations are sort of other things that are for not me. I mean, I get them. I've gotten every single pressing of these, and I've got various foreign pressings of them. And back in the 70s, when I used to drive a lot, when I was in school in Syracuse and drove a lot between New York and Syracuse, you know, go home for vacations or whatever the the red and the blue were great compilations to listen to but by and large to me the important stuff is the main albums and i my feeling is that i wasn't just expecting one of the next one of the remaining albums that hasn't been remixed to be the next big project i was uh, you know, I, I, I think that's the way it should be pretty much the same way as when they w did the love show. Um, my feeling was, well, you know, you still have to remaster the CDs. There's still other unreleased stuff to put out. There are various archival projects to put out. All of those are more important than a site specific thing in Las Vegas, which, you know, I went to the love show 10 years later and I loved it. But, mm. um, you know, uh, I, I just think that doing the red and the blue was not the most important thing um, to be done. I understand that from a commercial point of view, it has a certain appeal, um, but they already did the one album, you know, uh, which is equally unimportant to me. Um, and... So doing this is like, okay, you know, uh, people were spending a lot of time sort of worrying over whether, you know, well, what about the new stuff that was added? Do you think they added the right ones? Is Who cares? You know, this was an album that was put together in 15 minutes by Alan Klein. It wasn't something that the Beatles themselves really cared about it was a, a compilation um, it basically is responsible to some degree for red rose speedway being a single album instead of a double album mm. uh, because they felt we're already putting out two double beatles albums we don't want you know another double album from one of the beatles um, especially one whose last album wildlife didn't sell that well um, so but you know having said that um, you know, I'm always interested in remixes. And so, okay, we're not going to get the Rubber Soul remix right away and the Hard Day's Night remix right away, but we're going to be able to hear some tracks. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, maybe one of the reasons that they did this was that because they were going to be using the MAL system for certainly the first two albums, um, that were only recorded on two track. Uh, and I think they wanted to do a sort of proof of concept, you know, just to show that, okay, we can use this system to make reasonable remixes, stereo remixes, even surround mixes. Um, and we can now offer you a big sampler of what that can be like, which by the way, you can pay for. Uh, <laughs> So it's not like, you know, usually proof of concept things you don't necessarily have to pay for. It's, a, you know, but never mind. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I sort of like the idea that now and then was going to be included. I mean, care either way, but I also felt that if they were going to include now and then, they should have included real love and, and free as a bird. Mm -hmm. You know, why now and then just all by itself? Um, apologies to Eric Carmen. 
um you know it it just it, it just seemed sort of not as thought out as perhaps it ought to have been but you know again it's a compilation i don't really care whatever decision they want to make it's nothing to me well we've talked about this before but compilations have a purpose I and understand. It's for the casual fan or someone who's just starting to be a beatles fan and if it leads to discovering the rest of their catalog then i'm all for it so well, that's true but you know ken we, we talked about when we were talking about making the green album i think or you know we're, we're expanding the red and blue before they announced that they were going to um i think we pointed out that the red and blue together and especially with the expanded tracks account for a huge percentage of the beatles catalog right so why not just buy the whole beatles catalog you know good point good point but i'm just thinking that you know there was a whole new generation of beatle fans that discovered the beatles through the beatles one mm -hmm. and also same thing back in the 70s with the red and the blue so it's still if it leads to everything else yeah then I'm Look, for. that's oh. true i understand that and our pal peter jackson told us that the red and the blue were the first beatles things that, that he got okay. So, okay you know i understand that i i just think that the most important stuff is the actual catalog and unreleased archival stuff and compilations are fine but you know if we're waiting for that other stuff to come out um i don't want that stuff to have to go to the end of the line because a compilation is being done all right good point darren how did you feel about hearing the news first about the rhythm pretty much, pretty much <clears throat> agree with alan across the board except i don't have an issue with compilations in the first place i mean the red and blue albums First of all, were put together. One of the reasons they were put together was to counter that that bootleg that was mm -hmm. uh, popping up on what was it, on mail order on TV and maybe magazines, newspapers, Alpha Omega. Um, uh, but I'm sure also it means to make a few bucks. You know, just a few years after the Beatles broke up, uh, I love the Red and Blue albums. Um, you know. We did a show a couple of years ago on all the compilations that came out after the Beatles broke up. And yeah, okay, rock and roll music and love songs were probably, and real music definitely was unnecessary. And today, those type compilations would probably have been done much better um, than back in the 70s and 80s. 20 Greatest Hits used to always be an album that really irked me when especially when it came out and yet really it set the stage for one mm -hmm. so i liked red and blue had no problem with them reissuing it when they did uh, first as the double cd and then when they put it out they redid the packaging so that it matched cosmetically matched your uh reissued beetle cds from 2009 but i don't know about these these 2023 editions don't get me wrong, like everything else, I ultimately am happy to have them. I'd rather have them than not. Did we need them? No. Because the Red and Blue albums, almost like uh, regular studio albums of original material, the Red and Blue albums kind of became iconic in their own way, whether however they were created. You know, did Alan Klein, Alan, Alan points out that Alan Klein threw the uh, track lists for both albums together rather quickly um actually let me just point out because i have an issue here going back a few issues of mojo magazine and alan steckler is interviewed in here he was the guy who put together the hot rocks collections for the rolling stones and he was hired by alan klein to work in the production department to assemble the tracks for the red and the blue and he even pointed out that john lennon gave an interview i think it was to melody maker where john thought george martin chose all the material but alan says it was him he picked all the songs the only thing that he questions now is he he doesn't know why he put old brown shoe in there <laughs> but um it's it's in um it's in mojo magazine it's a pretty interesting interview 
because there's one thing that really struck me in here. This is a little detour from what we're talking about. But um, since The Red and the Blue came out in 1973, Alan had met with George Harrison, and he said that um, it's really important that we get rid of Alan Klein as our manager because if we don't do that, there's no chance of a reunion. As if George was still interested in there being a reunion hmm. in 1973. I thought that was really odd because he was always the one that seemed to be later on very dead set against it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, continue, Darren. Yeah, so whatever reason and however those albums were compiled, they ended up becoming our vision of the best of the Beatles. And whether you agreed with the track listing or not, whether Oh Blah D, Oh Blah Da should be on the Blue album in the first place, or maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe another song. You could split hairs and stuff like that. Look at the Red album, and I have the uh, song list here. And I don't know, maybe you could make an argument that. Everything belongs here, actually. But whatever, maybe if you find a track that you think should have been dropped, we're splitting hairs. And the bottom line is for 50 years, the Red and Blue albums kind of became these iconic um, things in the Beatles discography. Yeah. I don't really think there was a need. Maybe, maybe if when all is said and done, you want to put read the remastered tracks out and recompile, not recompile, but re-released the albums using the newest mixes that were done. Um, you, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, keep the track listing the same, but just update the sound of the CD by doing the remixed edition of the Red Album and Blue Album. I don't know. The adding the tracks seemed forced, seemed even maybe in some cases more random than the tracks that were initially on the albums. Um I, I can't help but think to get now to give now and then a home. All of this was done. It probably isn't that cut and dry, but mm -hmm. to give now and then a home, let's redo the red and blue albums, even though the red album has nothing to do with now and then. And Beatle fans want to hear remixes of the songs in the context of the albums. We're waiting for the with the Beatles box set. The, Beatles for sale box set. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Um, but then when all was said and done, I played the things. I like them. I'm glad I have them. But they weren't really necessary. I still think what should have been done was the re-release of the Beatles anthology hmm. on Blu-ray uh, and put out the Beatles anthology three with now and then. Not three. Put out the Beatles anthology four or some sort of best of the three anthology albums for a lesser idea and include now and then on that. And then that way you it would everything would sort of be in order. Free as a bird on anthology one, real love on anthology two, now and then is now part of the anthology series. Um, and you now have the anthology documentary on Blu-ray. Uh, and that's kind of nice. That would made sense. Yeah, that's what I think should have been done. Uh, I already feel like the new editions of the Red and Blue albums have been put away, you know, at home in my library. And who knows when I'll pull them out because my tendency might always be to reach for the ones that I was hearing uh, that really played a role in me learning about the Beatles growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, by the mid 70s, the Blue album. I had the red album on cassette and I had the blue album on vinyl. I got them like when I was around 10 or 11 years old, both albums. And those were very important in learning about the Beatles was that those albums, listening to the songs, reading the giveaway sheet and, and seeing where everything came from, even though some of the information on those sheets turned out to be inaccurate, but you had a sense of where everything came from. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so hopefully I made my, I made, I was good. I know I rambled a bit, but I was as clear. And in a nutshell, I could say, were they necessary? No. Am I glad I have them? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I think the Red album sounds great. I ha- I scratch my head a little bit. We'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this about the 2023 remixes on the Blue album. Um, sound a little half. <laughs> you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> some of some of them do sound a little half. Okay. Uh, but uh, it turns out the elephant in the room is a walrus, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and a wall, and it's not Paul, not this walrus. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, for the red album sounds great, and the red album is, I think, a really well. I don't know. It just it sounds great because you listen to it and you know you're hearing stuff better, sharper, mm-hmm. clearer. But you can't put your finger on exactly what it is about what you're listening to. You don't get this sense that you're hearing instrumentation that wasn't there the first time you heard it. There's not things popping up in the mixes. Not, a, not as often, but everything sounds better and more present on the Red Album. Okay, we'll get to that in just a few moments. But I I agree with you wholeheartedly about your feelings about the Beatles anthology and what should have been done and where now and then should have been placed. But going back to when we did a show on the Red and the Blue, which was long before we even knew about these remixes coming out, um, we were complaining that you could fit so much more material on the Red album. And here they put a lot of extra material on the Red album. So we should kind of be happy about that, you know? I I think my argument with that would have been more along the lines of the Red Album should have been on one CD. I I don't know if I ever wanted to see them fatten it up more. Maybe I did. Well, now I have it fattened up and I can tell you, (laughs) I think I liked it the way it was. (laughs) So now you're saying that the way it originally came out was perfect just as... If it wasn't perfect then... If it didn't mean anything to you in 1973, it does now because they became these um, important albums in the Beatles discography. Mm -hmm. Maybe you might not have thought much about them in 73. They were extra purchases. I already have all the Beatles albums. I don't need a great sits. But it was nice to have convenience sake, have everything in one place. And as the years went by, the Red and Blue albums kind of grew in stature. And became almost the, you know, the uh, the touch the the go to compilation albums when you want to put, you know, nice size packages for our other bands, best of packages, yeah. to use those as the uh, template. Well, I do think the Red and the Blue collections are really important historically because, especially with the Blue album, I think its release really influenced what radio played from the Beatles because it was on there. It gave those songs even more prominence being on the Blue Album. So chances are, if you were going to hear any song from Sgt. Pepper on a rock station, it was either going to be Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, With Little Help from My Friends, A Day in the Life, um, and Sgt. Pepper. You know, it just so happens that those are on the blue collection if you're going to hear anything from the white album you're going to hear back in the ussr you're going to hear obla oh, dio blada you're going to hear while my guitar gently weeps you know there's other songs you might hear but those are the ones that they really highlighted a lot on the radio and i think it's a significant release it's also kind of interesting because you know the beatles never had with the exception of a collection of beetle oldies really a greatest hits album unless you consider hey jude which was a compilation and for a band that had more hits than any other group it's kind of ridiculous not to have some kind of greatest hits but the red and the blue went beyond that even on the red album there were songs in there that were never singles in the first place like girl for example you know so it went deeper than just the singles and certainly that was the case with the blue album but anyway let's talk about first of all the red album and um, in particular, uh, your general um, impression of the sound of it. I know Darren just touched on that. But what songs do you think really stand out or have been really improved upon? Um, Alan, how about you to start? 
Yeah. Um, I don't know about improved upon so much as um, the remixes, as, as Darren said, made everything sound a bit clearer. Um, and I was listening to it again <clears throat> yesterday in the surround mix, because whenever possible, I listen to surround mixes now. Um, and for instance, uh, I saw her standing there. One thing that I noticed was that you hear a lot more of George's lead guitar part. I don't mean the solo. I mean the little things that he's doing all through the song. Um, you know, as we know, as a two track recording, you have the instruments basically on one side and the vocals on the other side by being able to separate them and remix them. Um, Giles Martin was able to sort of rebalance that instrumental side. So you were getting to hear a bit more of George. Um, I do think that a, a, a thing that struck me as a little weird um, in both the stereo and the surround, is that on I saw her standing there and also roll over Beethoven, and I think there were some others too. The lead guitar solos were sort of pulled back a little bit. You know, they were a, a little more recessed than they were on the original mono and stereo mixes. Mm -hmm. um, and in roll over Beethoven, one thing that struck me as odd in the stereo mix is that the intro... Uh, to the song is on the left channel and the guitar solo <laughs> is on the right channel, you know, okay. You know, I'm not outraged by it. It's just one of those things. It's like, well, why, why, you know, it depends, I guess, on your, your, your theory of stereo sound, you know, I mean, some people feel that stereo sound, you can do whatever you want that, sounds good to you and you can have different effects and for instance in ballad of john and yoko when you have those little guitar you know, de -de 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 things what they would do uh, in the original stereo mix and also on the new blue album mix is that the first two notes of, of that three note guitar thing are on one channel and the last note is on the other channel okay so that's an effect um but the other philosophy which generally speaking i felt that you know giles had taken with a lot of the other remixes that he's done so far is to present the band as a band you know more or less the way it would be on stage and you wouldn't have in that case george playing the intro to a song on the left channel and the solo on the right channel mm. you know um let's see what else uh people complain a lot about she loves you on on the red album it, it 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 didn't bother me i mean and that's listening to it knowing that people are complaining about it um sounded okay to me i mean it 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 could sound better it's it's kind of a muddy recording no matter what you do with it um for that time um but you know it's so drummed into our ears that any edition of it sounds great to me. I don't know. Uh, I didn't have a problem with the remix. Um, uh, Alan, Alan the, the stereo master for She Loves You was lost, right? As we, right. we heard. So they had so to do I, it out of, out, of mon, out of the mono using Mal. Okay. When I listen to She Loves You here, it sounds like it's a few generations There's a noticeable difference, especially when you, you're going from the previous track yeah. Which, um, me to you, it's like it it drops down in level, and it feels much more like a copy of a copy. Maybe I'm training my ears to think that way. <laughs> it is. I mean, if you think about it, they have the master tape for "From Me to You." They don't have the session master anymore for "She Loves You." So the best you can get is the mono mix which is a generation or two down from the session master. See what when I mean? was it lost? Probably 1963. For some reason, they appear oh. to have thrown it so, away. <laughs> so when She Loves You would get reused on, added to compilation albums in the 70s and 80s, at no point were we hearing a mask. Well, we weren't hearing the session master, you know, 
the session master the day they recorded it right straight onto the tape we were hearing a mix of that tape so we we're already down a generation at least one generation okay so when they say we lost the stereo master we lost the multi-track too because if you have the multi-track then theoretically you can still play with it right the multi-track is only two track for that but but they look they don't have that right but with Peter Jackson's technology, couldn't we do something with that? That's what they did. That's why we have a stereo mix now on the new Red album because of of that. But you're starting off with a source that's a generation down, at least one. Okay. See, because they don't have, whereas with For Me To You, they have the actual session tapes, although that had been lost for a while too. Someone stole it and then someone returned it. At the time that Mark Lewison did his recording sessions book, that tape was not in the archive and it was subsequently returned after he did that book. Don't know who had it. I didn't have it. <laughs> hmm. Except on boot, of course. We all got it on boot. Whoever had it bootlegged it. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Uh, you can't do that, I thought sounded particularly good and also you real you've really got a hold on me i mean a lot of them had i thought clearer textures clearer instrumental profiles than the previous stereo mixes or mono mixes um they just sounded good to me um but you know i mean you know unless you do the uh, I'm not one of these people who has to hear the song exactly as I heard it in 1964. You know, um, if something's a little different, if I hear a bit of a guitar part that I hadn't heard before, I kind of like that because I still have the 1964 mix. Yes. Um, you know, but where where I draw the but I but I feel that the the song should sound more or less the way it sounded, which is you know when we get to the Blue Album, I will go on a rant about. I am the walrus because it doesn't, you know, like I am the walrus would have been a nice mix for him to do for love, but to put out as part of the standard catalog or even a compilation appended to the standard catalog, I think it kind of should have sounded the way the record sounded, but more of that later. <laughs> okay. Any other tracks you want to talk about? Um, see how about the rubber soul material yeah you know that sounded good to me um but not particularly remarkable um it just sounded good and i i didn't have a problem with it and i wasn't exceptionally knocked out by it so it just was sort of oh that's nice and the surround <laughs> is nice you know i i i the thing i like about all these Beatles surround mixes is like standing in the middle of the room, cranking it up and feeling like you're in the middle of the band. You know, so much stuff is going on all around you. And it's uh, it's like, you know, with stereo, you would listen and say, oh, there's a you know guitar over there and there's a vocal over there and there's. Oh, yeah. But now with surround, it's like all around you, you know, and, and especially the first time you hear it. You know, you're you don't know where stuff is going to come from, hmm. um, you know, and they did a pretty good job with the rubber soul stuff uh, in that regard. You know, you really do feel surrounded by it because they're starting off with four tracks there, you know, um, and and anything that they did with Peter Jackson's and, and mouth system, um, you know, made it even more flexible than it was. So, um I think you know the the rubber soul stuff sounds good, and then after rubber soul, we're we're up to the stuff that we already had remixes of. So um, when I listened again to it all yesterday, I sort of you know zoned out once we got to Revolver because you know we know that we know those mixes now. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um... Were there any particular overall with the Red Album, anything that you feel like you heard more of? Did you hear a lot more of Paul's bass? Did you hear more, more drums from Ringo in particular on certain tracks? 
Yeah, I kind of feel like you hear more of everything, you know, mm. because because everything isn't squished into the mix. It's it's brought up a bit, you know, so you do hear more of the bass. You hear the drums have a, a more sort of tactile, palpable sound in a lot of cases. Um, but at least listening to it again yesterday, what I was especially taken with was the guitar sound, particularly George's guitar sound. Um, because uh, you you really got a sense of what he was doing in between the lines, you know, not just during the solos. Another one was Day Tripper. Um, you know, it, it really sounded like, you know, the guitar is in the room with you. You're hearing it being played. You're, you're sort of feeling it being played as if you're playing it, you know. Mm. Um, and it, it just it just had that clarity and texture uh, that that I felt was an improvement for a lot of those early songs. Okay. Darren, your thoughts about, uh, all I, hate, the I hate, I hate to disappoint, but I really didn't make detailed notes for every song because what I found was happening <clears throat> was that it was almost like every other song was, I was hearing similar things mm. and my, my notes were saying the same thing for every song that it was becoming brighter this, crisper that. Generally speaking, I found very few flaws um, on the one or two times, two times I listened closely to the whole Red album, that I would say. Um, but, I mean, right from the beginning, of course, what stands out of the first things you heard, I mean, right from the beginning, with Love Me Do and Please Please Me, everything seems to be separated, given its own little place, not made louder, not softer, uh, nothing new popping up in the mix that we didn't hear before. Just everything has got its 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 corner to be in. And it sounds the same, but it doesn't sound the same. It sounds brighter, but I couldn't tell you why, other than to try to like you know visualize the instruments just being separated, being in their own place. And I can only imagine what the surround sound would sound like. Um, so generally speaking, I don't have any tracks off the Red album to single out um, what I thought sounded better. I, I didn't notice what you said about She Loves You, Ken, but I want to go back now. I made a note for myself to listen to uh, For Me to You and then let it go right into She Loves You to hear uh, what you were talking about because it didn't. Uh, I didn't write anything down specifically about detecting anything that seemed a little muddy or lost um in the mix but uh generally speaking i was very impressed with the overall feel of the red album which then made it as good as the blue album still was then made the blue album a little disappointing because of the little nuances that really don't sound right which we'll get into in a couple of minutes okay that's it yeah yeah in a nutshell yeah i have one other thing <clears throat> one complaint from the Red Album. Um, and I, I noticed this yesterday listening on Surround, and I forgot to go back to the stereo to check it. But, and I love her, the vocal is bathed in reverb. And that struck me as like too much. You know, it's as if, it's as if Giles decided to Dave Dexterize it, you know. Um, Just in the Surround, though? That was in the Surround, yeah. Okay. So I, I I forgot to go back and check it on the stereo. So maybe you guys can tell me. But... Now, is it possible that that's whatever was done to the vocal is now more in your face when you have it in the surround setting? Well, it's kind of like less in your face because it used to less. be much drier vocal. You hear it like it's like Paul standing there singing in front of you, but now it's in reverb. It, it, it's sort of like he's ground in this okay paint. so it's not as powerful that way yeah I, I i preferred it with you know in the the dry sound but if you know it, it's 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 very possible that this is closer to what we heard as as kids when dave dexter put reverb on everything you know <laughs> okay i made notes on most of the songs but kind of like what darren said i find myself writing almost the same thing hey. for songs but um 
I did want to mention Love Me Do because what nobody ever seems to bring up is the fact that the version that they used yeah. of Love Me Do yeah. was the one with Ringo on drums, which was the UK single. Mm -hmm. And when the Red Album first came out, it was the Andy White version. Right. So, and they also made Love Me Do the B side of Now and Then. Right. A very nice touch. The the first Beatles single with the last Beatles single. I mean, Beatles song first and last. But um, I really wonder why this decision was made. If there was some politics involved to get the version that Ringo drummed on. But um, I did like the first time I heard it when it first leaked out with uh, with Now and Then. Um, the fact that you can hear the bass a little bit more in the mix. Um, or maybe it's just that everything was more separated and you heard more hand claps in this version. One of the things that I picked up on the Red Album was when there are hand claps on a song, you hear them more. Yeah, and especially yeah. Roll Over Beethoven, which That's I right. knew had hand claps, but it's continuous <laughs> throughout, I think, the entire song. But when you listen to this version, they really brought it up. Same thing with I Want to Hold Your Hand. Mm -hmm. Wherever there's hand claps, you just heard them more. Um, so I do wonder why they made that decision with Love Me Do. Nobody seems to even talk about that at all. But that's that's tampering with history, in a way. Because the original had the Andy White version. Uh, Please Please Me, I thought had more punch, a fuller sound. You can hear Ringo's drum fills a little better. I saw her standing there is definitely so powerful the drums seem to be more up front and more pronounced without overdoing it a little more hand claps i wrote <laughs> very lively uh twist and shout little separation in the guitar instrumental part strong in the backing vocals leading up to the last verses for me to you very full sound the harmonies are really clear uh separation of lead vocals you hear paul a little bit more the drum feels are clearer she loves you i wrote down biggest disappointment um not much high end at all in there uh i want to hold your hand the drums are crisper this boy sounds gorgeous the harmonies sound really full on this boy uh i think the bass was brought up a little bit more in the mix all my loving seems like the rhythm guitar part was brought up a little more drums towards the end the harmony stand out more towards the end of the song when paul is harmonizing with himself um you really got a hold on me backing vocals a little hotter it seems like they they push george's vocals up a little bit more to my ears anyway on that the harmonies just sound great can't buy me love in particular just sounds great there's nothing in particular i wrote about that other than it sounds fantastic you can't do that sounds powerful sounds like the backing vocals were brought up um a hard day's night and sometimes i i do this when i'm listening to anything new whether it's a remix or just a, a brand new album or something i listen in the car i listen in this room with my headphones on when i listen in the car to a hard day's night you really hear the bongos in the song which are played by norman smith mm -hmm. um i listen in this room didn't hear it as much. So a lot depends upon the stereo that you're that you're listening on. Um, more cowbell comes out a lot in the surround as well. The bongos. yeah, yeah. Okay, as a fuller sound on the piano solo. Um, and I love her. I think the acoustic stuff sounds richer, fuller. I think the acoustic stuff sound benefits a lot in the remixes. Um, yeah, the vocals from Paul are very clear. Um, eight days a week, I seem to hear more guitar playing in the fade up in the intro. There's a fuller sound on the harmonies. I feel fine. Harmonies sound fantastic. I hear more drum parts. Uh, Ticket to Ride, John and Paul's harmonies are sharper when they're singing together. I think it's today, yeah, and she ought to think right that part. Um, and you could just hear... I think separation more of the vocals between John and Paul. Yesterday is another song. <clears throat> Sorry. Yesterday is another song. Uh, Paul's lead vocals seem hotter in the mix. Nice full sound. The string quartet is in stereo. 
is is that the first time the quartets in stereo um i don't know help doesn't have the james bond intro which it did have in the original when it first came out um fuller sound on you've got to hide your love away with the flutes it's more atmospheric i felt um we can work it out the harmonies between paul and john a little more separated you hear more of the different parts between the two of them um day tripper you hear more in the harmonies especially the drums the guitars are in your face um drive my car same thing more in the harmonies more clarity there norwegian wood paul's harmony vocal is brought out more i think uh the sitar is very clear and crisp um on norwegian wood um there was a lot mentioned about nowhere man if there's a problem with nowhere man that the hi-hat is out of sync with the other tracks i'm listening i really can't tell but a lot of people have pointed that out um the harmonies just sound fantastic on nowhere man same thing with michelle about acoustic songs sounding better there's more clarity sonic clarity in there um on in my life i think the drums and the tambourine sound up pushed up a little more the piano solo is clearer the harmonies are fuller big difference to me and in my life big highlight for me if i needed someone the opening guitars are right in your face the harmonies sound fuller and great girl the lead vocals are clearer really nice and um i think that covers all the stuff leading to revolver how did you guys feel about the bonus cuts that were that were chosen? I know you said, Darren, you thought a lot of them were random. The ones that were on the Red Album were I Saw Her Standing There, Twist and Shout, This Boy, Roll Over Beethoven, You Really Got a Hold on Me, You Can't Do That, If I Needed Someone, Got to Get You Into My Life. Well, no, <clears throat> I, think the, I think the picks were almost dead on for uh -huh. the Red Album. Yeah. Uh, the fact that I saw her standing there was missing from the original is kind of an eye opener. Right. Uh, got to get you into my life being included on the new red album makes complete sense. Cause it ended up be becoming a hit. Uh, how here, there and everywhere wasn't on the original. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, uh, so I think the, the extra, the add ons to the 2023 edition on the red album are right on especially Twist and Shouts, another one that uh, it's interesting that it wasn't on the original album. Um, I am just had a, uh, they added George songs to the Red Album. The Red Album originally didn't have any. None. George Harrison songs was that, that was the one, right? Yep. Yeah. So that alone, they kind of did a little bit of, you know, remedy that problem. Um, but, uh, I like what they added to the Red Album. So now it's funny, and this happens with all the time with me, I find. Now I'm thinking of what I said about a half an hour ago about the additions to the Red Album, and now I'm like, well, wait a minute. No, not necessarily, Darren. I mean, like, I look on the Blue Album, again, not to get ahead, but, you know, I, I don't know about Dear Prudence and Glass Onion mm -hmm. needing to be there on the Blue Album. But on the Red Album, they, they uh, the picks were almost dead on in every instance. What was it? Twelve new tracks added, uh, and uh, they make sense. Especially got to get you into my life and twist and shout leading the way. Yeah. Well, they also made sure originally when the red album came out that that it was all original material. Same thing with the blue right. album. All original. Yeah, yeah. So you can't. Yeah, I mean original material. I mean, so there's a few covers. You, you could really make a case that the Beatles version of Twist and Shout is the definitive one. Now, it wasn't their song, but it belongs on a Beatle compilation. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. The other Revolver songs that I didn't get to mention that are on here for the first time <clears throat> are I'm Only Sleeping, Tax Man, Here, There, and Everywhere, and Tomorrow Never Knows. I would surprise Rain wasn't put on the blue album, red album. Yeah. On the red album. Uh, Rain was one I was looking for and thought, see, I would have put Rain on on there ahead of 
if I needed someone or I'm only sleeping. But again, you know, nice splitting hairs. But Rain, I'm surprised, wasn't even on the original. Okay. Alan, what did you think of the bonus material? What was chosen? I think I sort of already said that since it's a compilation, it doesn't matter to me what's on it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I put it on, I listen to it. It's all great stuff. I'm happy for everything that's on there. And uh, just as soon put on the actual albums and listen to those. So, you know, it's it, what they added and, if they had subtracted anything, which they didn't, but if, if, well, apart from the original Love Me, the album version of Love Me Do, uh, I, I can't get exercised over these things. Mm. It, it's, it's just, it's a compilation. <laughs> <laughs> you have no affection for these things. I think it's kind of important because you kind of want to see what you think is their best material or what makes the most sense. Um, well, and, that's all of it. <laughs> well, you know, and I love her, no doubt about it, is one of the greatest Beatle love songs. But it's hard for me not to associate and I love her with If I Fell back to back, because right. they're both two of the greatest love songs, both from the same film and same album. And I kind of wish If I Fell was in there. And when it comes to Beatle covers, yeah. I saw Sally was one of the best ones they did. I mean, I I love all the covers. I love Bad Boy a lot, but I can certainly just for Paul's vocals alone <laughs> on Long Tall Sally and the band really cooks on it. I kind of wish that was in there, but you know, we're splitting hairs, like Darren said. You, everybody has their favorites, but um, you know, If I Fell really sticks out for me. That really should have been on there. Um, okay, why don't we uh, move on to the Blue Album? And most of it, like I said, was uh, already remixed from the Sgt. Pepper material on. Um, the stuff that we're getting new remixes for would be, let me look at this here. Uh, let's see. All You Need Is Love, I Am The Water, The Magical Mystery Tour on Yellow Submarine material. Hello, Goodbye, Fool on the Hill, Magical Mystery Tour. Um, what am I missing? Also, oh, well, hey, bulldog, as well, and revolution, right? So, what did we think about those mixes? Um, and uh, you know, it's it's so obvious when all these box sets came out how they, for whatever reason, decided not to tackle magical mystery tour and yellow submarine. So for many of us who we are looking forward to hearing, especially the Magical Mystery Tour material on there. So what did you think of it? Let's start with Darren this time. I found that, well, first of all, we were, Ken and I um, were at that listening session for now and then in, uh, it was in November, I think. Oh, October. no, it was actually in, in October. October? Yeah. And, and that's when Apple laid out for uh, the media, um, played now and then, explained the whole story. We saw the making of video, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and the Red and Blue albums were presented, what changes were going to be made and what additions. And we were given a sampling of a few tracks. And we heard I Am The Walrus as one of the uh, blue album uh, tracks and a brand new mix and it sounded strange in, in, in the theater mm. and a lot of people thought it sounded strange it seemed to get stranger as the song went along uh, and then when you get to the end and you have all those voices the Shakespeare the, Shakespeare, the, 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 the Shakespeare help me with the word here Shakespearean <laughs> uh, the damn things out of Shakespeare uh, at the end of the song, they would the, the voices were disappearing. They weren't where they should have been. Some were heard, some weren't. It got very weird, the mix. And it was almost dismissed as this wasn't the proper mix 
being played on the proper system is what we were told. Uh, but when the time comes, hmm. you know, okay, fine, I buy it. Uh, using that then as the point of of reference with the Blue Album, I couldn't help but then go back and find fault with some of the other 2023 mixes. Uh, nothing is glaring as I am the walrus, where things seemed lost in the mix and things were, were were way exaggerated from what we were used to hearing. I heard little bits of that here and there in some songs. I think the one that, uh, I think the Fool on the Hill, there were elements of the Fool on the Hill that seemed a little out of whack on the new mix. Hmm. Um, what was another one that jumped out at me? So then again, I start to question my ear and I go back to listen to I Am The Walrus. And am I now hearing things that really aren't there? Am I looking to nitpick at all the 2023 mixes? Uh, but there is definitely, you can tell that they were worked on at a, separately from everything else that was on, on the Blue Album. Um, and these older mixes are coming from the sources that we already have. White album box sets or the pepper box sets, etc. Um, so I would say, I mean, as a listening experience, the blue album kind of takes off a lot like it, the red album does, and then you hit that point with "I Am the Walrus," which throws you. Because, and, I, and I'd love to know exactly how and why with that. Um, maybe Alan should, or or Ken, you can elaborate more on your impressions of what's going on or what's not going on on I am the walrus hmm. cuz that's the that's the that's the song that's the light what is that's the song that is uh, ga gathering uh, is generating the most conversation about the pluses and minuses of doing these new remixes yeah well the major complaint although there seem to be several about i am the walrus is what happens at the end like you said the king lear bit which was fed right to the mixing board as it was and a lot of that dialogue is being buried you know it's being yeah. cut up and it's really distracting and you do hear the sound of like but not all of it some of it's there some of it's not yeah it's like what's going on here but why? Right, <laughs> why right. Do something like that. Yeah, I mean th that King Lear stuff was one of the defining elements of "I Am the Walrus," and it may have been random because it was live on the radio while they were mixing and all that stuff. But random or not, it became an important part of the last minute or so of the song, and the actual end of the song any time you play the original recording is is he dead sit you down father rest you mm -hmm. is not there anymore right now what the hell is that you can't have yeah. the end of a song not be there you know uh it, 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 it's sort of i mean one explanation i'd heard is that giles was trying to make the connection between i am the walrus and revolution nine and so you know played up the random elements and the noise and all that stuff rather than the shakespeare i don't buy that as an explanation another is that well you know the, the i am the shakespeare got lost because it was you know in coming in with all the other noise and well first of all the mal system should have made it possible to separate that out completely but you don't even have to because that entire king lear recording is available on its own so even if something in the mixing made you lose it you could just go get the recording and replace it with the actual recording that was you know aired that night it's out there people have it i have it um i, I just don't i, I you know, I, I like Giles Martin. Um, I've defended a lot of his mixes that, you know, people have been upset because you hear something that 
had been buried before and people argue that, well, maybe the Beatles wanted it buried. That's why it was buried. So we shouldn't be hearing it now. Yeah. You know what? I like hearing other bits and all that stuff and, uh, and, and a certain amount of creative leeway and the original mixes are there, but this, I am the walrus for me is by far the worst thing he's done. Um, the second worst is the 2015 mix from uh, one of, uh, of of a day in the life. I think I think it was either on the surround mix or the stereo. I'm not sure if it was on both, but he forgot to put in the second piano, and that's one of those things. You know, right before the vocal comes in, that second piano is you know dun 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 gone. It's not in the mix. You know, you want to hear, you know, okay, it's fine if a new element that had been buried is now given some prominence and you can hear what else they were doing, but you definitely want to hear all the stuff that you originally heard on the record. And especially things like in the case of King Lear, things that were absolutely intrinsic to the personality of that recording. You know, so my dislike of that track has sort of colored my entire feeling about the new Blue Album remix, even though none of the other remixes really bother me particularly. But um, it's, it's just something about that is like, I don't want to play that album because eventually that remix is going to come up and I'm going to have to hear it again. Mm. I'm just going to get you know, upset. So, so basically you don't mind hearing things you never heard before, but you don't want anything taken out that you're used to hearing. Yeah. Especially if it's an important element, you know, yeah. of the song. So, right. Yeah. No, I see your point. Mm. Um, I was very disappointed when I heard the end of fire and the walrus. And when we were listening, by the way, at this uh, press event, Darren, we were listening to the Dolby Atmos. Right. Where, and, and, and when I, what I didn't like most of all was that it sounded very compressed. The yeah. Sound, it just sounded yeah. like garbage <laughs> to me. It really didn't sound good. And it was almost as if everyone felt that way. And I don't remember who spoke at the very, very end and sort of said, and here we are in the Dolby studio, but in so many words, I got the impression uh, that we were being told this isn't the ideal system. Hmm hear this mix on hmm. okay all right i listen i'm 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 not i'm i'm a i'm a wannabe novice audiophile i don't have an ear that you know will like like with the red album after song after song after song the nuances start to all become one to me not hmm. being able to single out tracks so all right so somebody tells me that here i am in the dolby studio and maybe something was a little off with the system, sound system, playing this mix. I'm going to probably take their word for it. But then when the actual, when I got my hands on the actual album weeks later, I was like, oof. I mean, nothing else on the album stands out like I Am The Walrus does. Hmm. Now, Alan said, which was, he, he said it clearer than I think of my point was, Alan said that, Essentially, this new mix taints the rest of the new Blue Album for him. He doesn't want to hear the new Blue Album mix because of I Am The Walrus. I found that I may have been nitpicking on what other songs were mixed in 2023. Probably at the same time that I Am The Walrus was remixed. Okay, here's one. The Fool on the Hill. And I'd be listening and I'm like, you know, something doesn't sound right here. But it, is it now am I looking for stuff that's not there anymore? Uh, so I sort of kind of thought, oh, oh here comes another 2023 mix. Uh, what's this going to sound like? Whereas Alan feels that way about the whole album, the album as a whole. Um, it's amazing how that one song, this new mix of one song has sparked this sort of reaction. <laughs> Uh, and you wonder how it got past quality control because there has to be somebody at Apple or somebody 
along the lines of that filter from Giles Martin, Peter Jackson, through the line till it gets okayed and passed John and Ringo, uh, excuse me, sorry, Paul, Ringo, uh, you know, Sean, Danny, and Olivia. Uh, somebody may have said, hey, hold on a minute, what's going on here with Iron Belongs? Do you guys think that, that Paul and Ringo really do sit down and listen to this? Yeah. I think they do. I don't know if they inspect, and I don't know if they listen to every song. And if they're given, I would think if they're given, say, a master, uh, if they're given, uh, you know, a CD with the complete album like this, that they're skimming it, maybe with another pair of ears sitting with them. Hmm. You know, uh, and I think so. I think that they were here. I mean, if I were if I were one of the Beatles, I'd be listening through this, and I would just assume in sampling pieces of songs, something like this. That all right, they know what they were doing; they got it right, mm -hmm. and not expect something to get past me that shouldn't be there. But I think they. I'm sure they listen. I think it probably. Uh, the way things are packaged and marketed might catch their attention more than the actual sound of things. Hmm. You know, that's uh, another thing that's kind of interesting that our opinions of the Red and Blue albums as a whole, that they didn't feel the same way. You know, do we need to have these somewhat expanded editions really as a vehicle for now and then? Not to go back to what we were talking about before. Well, but, I questioned when these releases came out if they, they were looking for some kind of an excuse to put now and then somewhere. But then the reasoning could be, well, the red and the blue, it's the 50th anniversary, more of a reason to put that out. But I agree with you, Darren, now and then belongs more on an anthology release of some kind. So Yeah, even if now and then came out and stayed a single. And then they don't get to maybe do an upgrade of anthology for five years. Hmm. And then you could like, then you can get a little more mileage out of it. It's back. You know what I mean? Uh, now it's on an album. Uh, and now it's on the Beatles anthology four or the Beatles anthology anthology. Hmm. Or what, you know, anyway. Plus it would get another well, remix the way real love and free as a bird did. And well, I, you know, you know, that's probably coming and people, I know. And that'll be another one where, Everyone wants the mouse system to be used on Free as a Bird in Real Love. And while that would be cool, I kind of contradict myself because I'm like, no, leave them alone. That's what you did in 1990. Wait a minute. That's the exact opposite of what I've been talking about. So, I mean, I don't know. They're coming, though. You know that. It's there's That's got to be in, in the pipeline at some point. But... Um... You know, I've always said as long as the original mixes remain in print, I don't mind the remixes coming out. But my only fear is that new generations might be brought up on the remixes and thinking this is the way it came out. And it's important to know how the Beatles released their own material when all four of them were alive. You know, to allow them to go out that way. Although... This is opening up a whole can of worms here on this show because you can always make the point that in the beginning, they really only cared about the mono mixes. Mm. They certainly didn't approve the American mixes of their albums when they came out. But, um, you know, they're operating as best as they can with Paul and Ringo to approve it and the Lennon and Harrison estates to approve them as well. But I still want to, you know, well, in their early 80s, did they really have the time to sit back and listen to all this and, and nitpick and, you know? Are they going to remember every single nuance in every Beatles recording? No. No. You know, you brought up, I don't mean to get off topic here, but you brought up an interesting point about future generations. I have always sort of thought, while I could go to what stores are left, but a music store who are selling say Beatles vinyl and go through the Beatle records. And it could be very, it is very confusing because you do have the mono white album, the stereo white album, um, 
you you have uh, when the U.S. albums came out uh, and they were available individually uh, off the box set. You had those in the mix, maybe a little less so now. I don't know if they're still in print, uh, but there was a period there where it was very confusing for a novice uh, to go buy Beatles music. And probably actually the same thing now if you went to Amazon and you can't hold the physical item in your hand before purchase. What are you getting when you buy this mono mix of this album as opposed to the stereo mix of this album? Or what do they mean, U.S. this? And you know what I'm saying? That, that, that is a confusing thing that's becoming more and more confusing, perhaps, as these reissues keep coming out. Are the original Red and Blue albums still available? That's a good question. <laughs> it's probably okay. A uh, because, I mean, I've seen uh, in print, I've seen online, I think Spotify, the red and new Red and Blue albums say on the cover, 2023 edition, mm -hmm. hold up your CDs. You got them there, Ken. But you have the red one, right? Didn't you have them right there? Yeah. Model the red one for us, Ken, please. Ken can't find it. There it is. There it is. And it says nothing on the bottom. Or just to say on the back. 2023. On the, it on says on the back. Put it on the front, too. That's what it should say. So that it jumps out at you. Sorry, folks. To uh -huh. slap the face. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Little slightly could be misleading to someone who doesn't know any better. Right. That only if the original is still out there. If they've left them in print. Mm hmm you know, when we talk Second about line. the original, um, this is not the only changed version of the red and blue. Um, I believe uh, on one of the previous reissues, they replaced some of the um, tracks that had originally only been available in mono with stereo versions. Um, I can't yeah. remember what year that was, but but we've actually had several different iterations of the red and the blue. And yeah. I believe also the James Bond intro to help. Was that on the British album, no. British Red album? No, I don't think so. Yeah. So I think at some on... point, the first CD version don't no. have that. So so you know what the, what the original red and blue are i mean we're now like four or five editions away hmm. from the original lp cassette versions that we had as kids so but again it's a compilation <laughs> it doesn't matter what the original was you know you, you can keep changing it it doesn't really matter it's not like you're it's not like you're taking Lucy in the sky with diamonds off of Sergeant Pepper and putting Penny Lane on instead, you know. I'm okay. shopping on Amazon right now, excuse me. <laughs> I'm looking to see what comes up when I go looking for the Red Album. Um, they need to do a, a 20, well, now we would make it a 2024 edition of 20 Greatest Hits. Sorry, I won't, I won't open that can of worms. I'm being funny. Now, it looks like the originals might still be available. Yeah, I think they are. Hmm. Okay. Yep, they are. You can still buy them on Amazon. Good. Still in stock. All right. But what other songs would you like to talk about on the blue other than I Am the Walrus Staring? Um, well, just mixes aside. Okay, just content and songs that are on the album. Hmm. Um, now and then doesn't work at the end of the album. I love now and then. I really do. Hmm. It just does not work after the long and winding road. Um, and if you're going to add now and then, I think they should have probably put free as a bird and real love too to complete the picture. I agree, especially since we free as a bird. They both charted right. We free as a bird did. They may yeah. not have real love charted correctly. Yes, it went to yeah. number eleven. In, yes, in the I mean they're, they're right there. Justification to put them on the blue album with the new song and now and then. If they I, were, if they were remixed, if real love and and free as well, a well, all right, then that would be another debate we'd be having. 
straight remix of what came out in the mid nineties or complete overhaul where Lennon's demo is treated, uh, you, you know, with modern technology, with Mal, right. we get a new version because they would be new versions. Then mm -hmm. that would be beyond a remix. Uh, if they did that, but without getting into that kind of detail, uh, free is a burden, real love. You can make the argument belong here, but still, the dramatics of the long and rewinding road ending the blue album would be lost. Mm -hmm. I don't know where else you would want to put them then. Um, I don't know about glass onion. I don't know about dear prudence being here on, on the blue album, the new one. Uh, I love, I want you. She's so heavy, but another one, I don't know if it needed to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's all opinion. Um, there are those who probably feel that Obladi Oblada should never have been on the Blue Album. John Lennon probably would think that. Uh, and I'm trying to think. Really, I didn't. I didn't really end up taking any notes uh, of the individual tracks. I mean, just everything sounds terrific. Uh, but again, more times than not, you're hearing mixes that we've heard already. It's just those, what is it, eight, what did we say, eight songs, including I Am the Walrus, that gets the 2023 treatment. Right. Um, so really, it's more along the lines of the eight songs that get added. Is it eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Songs get added, whatever, eight or nine. Uh, and now and then's placement. Did any of the, the new mixes impress you that were on the blue? The ones that you just mentioned? No, I didn't I didn't I didn't make any notes of anything specifically that made me say I want to bring this up. You know, it was usually if it was positive, it was that it's just generally sounded good, but it was hard to put your finger on why. Okay. It wasn't necessarily an instrument brought up higher in the mix. It just in general sounded, it sounded really good. It's clean or it sounded brighter or whatever. Uh, so I, I, I should have probably, I think by the time I got towards the end of the Blue album, you know, it was like, it was starting to set in a little bit. Hmm. Okay. By the way, I, I should also mention in this same issue that I pointed out of Mojo Magazine. Um, Which is an older issue, isn't it? What's that? It's last year? No, it's, it's the January issue okay. of this okay. year. Which probably you could have gotten in December. Because sometimes you get them ahead of time here in the States. Um, anyway, they, they do say somewhere in here that Glass Onion was chosen because of the movie that came out a year or two ago with the same title. So I thought it was a pretty odd choice okay. there. Okay. But that seems to be the reason why. Um, as far as the new remixes of the blue stuff, Alan, any thoughts? Um, not really. I, I, my my feeling was pretty much what Darren said. You know, they they sounded okay, but for me, the whole thing was just so overshadowed negatively by "I Am the Walrus" that um, that uh, I haven't spent a lot of time with it. You know, I put it on. Um, most things sounded to me like they're supposed to sound and that was fine and then mm. I got to I'm the walrus so that to me was the one big impression that disaster atrocity anyway okay I wrote down a few things um, and sometimes to really even though you've heard the Beatles recordings and the original mixes hundreds of times sometimes you need to A B everything you can really make a comparison. Although it's also important to note what just off the top of your head you find to be different. Um, in the case of Hello Goodbye, uh, I think the piano was brought up a little bit. Not drastically, but it seemed to be a little bit hotter. Mm -hmm. Fool on the Hill, uh, unlike you, Darren, I think it has an incredible sound, a really full sound. It's the best I've heard of Fool on the Hill uh, so far. I can't pinpoint any specific instrumentation that they, where there was a difference. Just overall, it just sounds so really full. Magical Mystery Tour, 
um, falls into at the very top seems to be very kind of distant. You know, the first few words that he says, magical mystery tour, step right this way. Um, right around the 130 mark, it has a real full sound to it. Um, otherwise, it's not that different to me. Revolution to me sounds great. A lot of people have complained about Revolution. I think the drums are mixed hotter. You can hear the fills better from Ringo, especially before the last verse. Um, Old Brown Shoe. A lot of people have complained about Old Brown Shoe. Um, the lead guitar, from what I understand, was double tracked, but it's missing one of those tracks. And the one that you normally hear, the one that's more up front in the original, you hear the other lead guitar, I think, because it does sound very different. And why would they make that difference? Um, and Hey Bulldog, again, this is a case of, in the car I heard this, not as much with the headphones here in this room, but there's more percussion stuff that's added from Ringo and Hey Bulldog that I never heard before, which sounds kind of awkward. Now, some people, like you, Alan, if you hear something new you never heard before, it's worthwhile. Um, yeah. It just didn't seem to work, but I could understand why it wasn't brought out in the in the original mix. Mm -hmm. So it's always interesting to hear things that you never heard before, but, you know, sometimes there's a reason for it. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, like I've always said, in a business point of view, I'm glad to see any new releases come out. Because it keeps the Beatles name out there and certainly Capital Universal has done their part in bringing out the Beatles names every year, certainly towards the end of the year with a new release. So I'm happy to see people talking about it. Um, but I'm always concerned about whether or not future generations listen to the new remixes and don't really experience the original mixes. You know, because uh, like it or not, with all the respect that I can give to the Lennon family and the Harrison family, it's not the same thing as having John and George here. And George could be very particular about what goes out mm -hmm. as, as we have pointed out. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's about it for the red and the blue. Um, what, what did you think of the, well, I know how you feel about compilations, Alan, <laughs> but the, uh, the other material that I think was chosen, I know you talked about it, uh, Darren, Blackbird, I'm glad that's in there. That's become yeah. a real classic now. Dear Prudence, Glass Onion, I felt was a kind of an odd choice. I'm really happy because I recognize what a masterpiece I think it is within you, without you. Although some people who still haven't gotten the whole message and all the, the work that was poured into that song and the arrangement from George Martin of all the different instrumentation uh the western instruments and the eastern instruments um i'm glad it's in there but i think some people might have thought that was an odd choice um uh, i'm glad hey hey bulldog is in there great rocker oh darling i'm i'm great is in there but kind of like what you said alan about so much of the beatles catalog is now in these two collections every song from side one of abbey road is on here except for maxwell mm -hmm. that's it um I mean, mine, I guess it's to have more Harrison material. Like I I would have preferred It's All Too Much or something like that over I Mean Mine, although that would have taken up more space. But then they also had I Want You, She's So Heavy, which also I felt was a little of an odd choice. I love it, but it's a long track, and I'm just not used to it at all on this compilation. It kind of sticks out a lot. Right. Um yeah um so that's about it i'm glad that there's bonus material just you know you're getting more for your money that way but you know i do have a, a few issues about what was chosen not too many and there you go so why don't we move on to ben on the run the underdubbed mix before we do that because i have a tendency sometimes to forget bringing up certain things <laughs> um alan we were talking about this this new bootleg that's out there of band on the run material would you like to comment about it yeah and um actually it's it it fits really well with the underdub mixes of of band on the run uh uh the 
the bootleg, which is on the HMC label. I can't remember what the name of it is, um, but it was just announced. It's um, I don't believe it's really out there yet, um, but it, you know, it will be turning up very soon. Um, the two major pieces of it are from the Jeff Emmerich estate. Uh, one of them is a mix that Emmerich made right before they left Lagos. So it's all the stuff that they recorded in Lagos, which is not the whole album. Um, for instance, Jet isn't there. Uh, there were a few songs that were recorded in London. Uh, uh, I think Bluebird as well. Um, and possibly 1985. Uh, anyway, it, it's 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 recorded. Uh, it it's mixed at the end of September, nineteen seventy three, and these mixes are quite different. I mean, the 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 mixes on the under the underdub mixes, so called, are also pretty different. But these are light years different. Uh, I mean, Band on the Run is actually kind of a mess. Um, because whole sections of it are, you know, not quite finished. And there are bits where uh, things are repeated, which, you know, were dealt with later in an edit. You know, you edit out the bit where you said it, sang it twice, you know. Uh, uh, a lot of the instruments aren't there. Um, let me roll it in no words, have no vocals. Um yeah, and Picasso also, the last thing they recorded in in Lagos is quite different from what you know. I mean, it hasn't got any of the effects and uh and uh it's very a very primitive version of that song. That and Band on the Run, both very primitive versions. So um that will be very enlightening. Uh the other thing that's on this bootleg is an effects tape, which is not fundamentally interesting because it's just effects, except that some of the effects are, for instance, you know, the French broadcast that was sampled for Picasso, the party scene that was sampled for Picasso, and then other things that they were thinking of but didn't use. For instance, uh, you know, there were some like cannons uh, that, uh, you know, in, in, if, if you if you remember your Charles Dickens uh, stories that involve prison breaks, um, I can't remember which one it was, probably Great Expectations. Uh, you know, when someone breaks out, out of a prison in Britain, they fire off cannons so that, you know, in the surrounding area, they know there's been a prison break. They had some cannon sounds and, you know, you can figure that, okay, maybe in, in band on the run itself, they were going to use the cannon sounds, but they decided not to. Um, at one point, I think there's a, a, a jail door closing, but it sounds so similar to what the Stones used at the beginning of uh, We Love You that maybe he decided not to do that too. Um, but the thing is, it's, it's, a, it's a compilation of sound effects that were put together for potential use throughout the band on the run album some of them were used some of them weren't so that's the second batch of stuff on this new bootleg um the rest there's you know zoo gang everyone knows from the b-side of um uk Facebook. uk band on the run uk single hey band on the run yeah okay sorry um that had been uh, commissioned as a TV theme for uh, a, a show that I think only lasted a season. Um, what they've put on here is the versions that were actually used in the TV show, in the intro and in the and the ending, um, which are you know edits of of the recording we know, but they're a little different. Uh, and Alan, I when was Sue Gang recorded? When? When? I think that was earlier in 73 as well, maybe even earlier. Than April that. of 73. April, oh, okay. 73, oh, yeah. Yeah. April and May. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but anyway, 
the rest of the stuff on the boot leg is more or less filler. You know, I think it's, uh, there was a not rock band. I think it was guitar hero that had some band on the run tracks that had separations. And so there was some remixes based on that. Um, and there might've been some, uh, I think they have some single edits, on there as well but the two main things are those two tapes from jeff emmerich's estate uh the sound effects tape and the mixes of the lagos recordings yeah by the way just since i have it right by my side here the the luca parassi book you are right there in um in saying that jet that jet was recorded in london right 1985 was as well and so was bluebird Bluebird. So none of those songs were worked on in Lagos. Right. Right. So none of them appear on this bootleg either, you know, on, on that section of the bootleg anyway. Right. Um, so basically it's, it's kind of interesting because what you get to hear on the bootleg is what Paul brought back with him from Lagos. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you an appreciation for how much work was done in London because the difference between this tape and the finished band on the run album is pretty immense. So, yeah. yeah. And then in between is the underdub mixes. Um, these are mixes from October 14th, 73. Um, the orchestral session was, I believe on the 17th, you can check Luca if you want. Um, <laughs> Uh, the 14th was a Sunday and Paul tended not to work on Sundays in the studio. There are some recordings he made on Sundays, but generally speaking, he preferred to have Sunday off. Um, so whether he was there for these mixes or whether just Jeff Emmerich made these mixes, basically what it is is these are mixes made preliminary to the orchestral recordings and it's possible that Paul took those home and that night is the night that he met with uh, Tony Visconti and some of what he did with Tony Visconti was to, to play him some of the recordings but he also played a lot of stuff on the piano because he wanted to show Tony what he wanted uh, in the arrangements. And then Tony was given, this was Sunday night and the orchestral session. So it was the 14th, the orchestral session was the 17th. So that's what like Wednesday, Tony had like three days to make the arrangements and then had to go conduct them at the orchestral sessions. And this is why he was a little bit put off to not get credit as an arranger and conductor on the Band on the Run album. Um, but basically, this bunch of mixes is the state of things before the orchestral sessions, more or less. Um, there's no vocal on 1985. Um, when we did volume one of legacy we surmised that the vocals must have been done on the 15th or 16th um to be ready in time for the uh the, or the orchestral sessions um not entirely strong whether sure whether we're wrong about that or whether Paul just decided that the vocals he did needed to be replaced. And so Jeff made a mix without vocals because the backing vocals are there. And generally speaking, you know, if the backing vocals are done, the lead vocal is also done um, because the backing vocals react to the lead vocal in, in a lot of ways. Um, so it's possible that he had recorded the vocal, then the backing vocals, and then got rid of the vocal before this mix. There's no vocal on this mix in any case. Um, so the finished vocal must have been sometime after the 14th, but probably before the 17th. Anyway. I'm just looking here at Luca's book. And just for the song, Bad on the Run, the basic track was done September 3rd through the 7th. Um... And then the overdubs are October 17th, 
but then there's more of overdubs on the 18th and 19th. So the 17th is definitely a day when Tony Visconti was yep. involved. Yep. Um, and 1985 says the recording started October 5th and then overdubs on October 10th and October 17th overdubs and then October 28th more overdubs. It's probably not Tony's work there, you know, on the 28th. I don't know for sure, but oh, that could be the finished vocal. Yeah. Okay. It's great. What were the dates in Africa again from when to when? For um for which song? Just in general. Work work on everything that took place in Lagos from when to when. I think they arrived like uh the very end of August, like the thirtieth or thirty first. Um, but it was several days before they could start recording because the studios were not really recording ready. Right vocal booths <clears throat> built and all kinds of other things. <clears throat> and then I think they left on like the 22nd of September. About three weeks, maybe, maybe not quite. Yeah, it was about three weeks. It says here, the basic tracks part one uh, were recorded September 3rd through the 14th. And then more basic tracks on September 17th. And so the first the first basic tracks were done at uh, Arc Studios in Ikegia. Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> Ikegia, yeah. Uh, the only thing done at Arc oh, was, was Picasso. I'm sorry, it's in Apapa. And then the second basic tracks were in Ikegia. So that was on the 17th of September. And then they moved to Air Studios. Right. And then after that, to Abbey Road Studios. Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was the night of recording Picasso at Ginger Baker's Arc Studio that they got mugged. And then the next day they went to EMI and Paul collapsed. Uh went to the hospital, was told to sort of rest for a few days. And while he was resting for a few days, he decided we're going back. You know, so the last thing was there was sort of like a party for them at EMI Studios and then down on the beach. Um, but then the next day he flew back to EMI. And when asked at the airport how everything went, he said, no problems. <laughs> <laughs> Easy going, Paul. Mm -hmm. Thumbs up. So he was able to record after he got mugged. No, before. Before, okay. Picasso was was before right. was the day right. he got mugged. Yeah. All right. So for anyone curious, there is the actual full album of Band on the Run, and it's taken from the 2010 remaster, mm -hmm. the box set first came out. But as far as the underdub mix, what are your impressions of them, of all the, the different songs? Um, it's every song except Helen Wheels. Uh, Darren, why don't we start with you? I was interested in the a different track running order. If I, if I knew that there was a, a different running order for the tracks in the past, I, could have, I completely forgot about it. So um, I remember the very first time I listened before I actually had my physical copies, was on Spotify. So that threw me. I thought I was on shuffle when it went from Band on the Run to Mamunia. Um, but uh, that aside, that's that's a minor, minor point. Um, I, I went in with very low expectations because it just seems as though, even though there were different reissues, we've been semi-reissued out when it comes to Band on the Run. Uh, what else could there be? I mean, we've heard, we've talked about here on this show about Paul's early demos done prior to going to Africa with the original Wings lineup uh, with Henry McCall and Denny Sidewell. That a lot of stuff that ended up on Band on the Run was rehearsed prior to the trip to Africa. And those were the tapes that were stolen when he got mugged. But as Alan has pointed out in the book, they were copies. They were cassette copies. The master tapes still exist. That would have been nice to hear. And then I realized, well, 
the 60th anniversary is coming up in in 10 years so we got to save those uh, i'm kidding maybe i'm not the new bootleg uh, i was a little uh, you know underwhelmed with these underdubbed mixes because i was like what's this what are they creating here and as it turns out uh it was a, a very pleasant listen a pleasant surprise uh that these were mixes as it turns out that were done in october of 73 not like some sort of late period creation for the sake of a reissue and you get a nice look at um really what were raw takes uh, of these songs, not necessarily early demos, not first takes, um, but early takes, no frosting put on top yet, no orchestration. And with those elements missing, you get to hear little things in the songs uh, clearer, not like the remixes we were just talking about with the Red and Blue album, but you might hear a full guitar solo that might have been semi-drowned out by orchestration on one song and those are interesting alternates alternate ways of listening to these songs um and i did make individual notes for most of uh the band on the run tracks um band on the run is pretty self-explanatory i didn't really get into any detail there if you heard it when it was first released when they announced this album um, you hear lots of differences. Um, so I started with really with Mamunia, uh, and my notes here say the fairly straightforward, uh, unadorned, almost like an acoustic version of the song. Uh, but on no words, the guitars are so clear and crisp. McCartney's bass is booming. Uh, I, I j enjoyed hearing what I would assume was some cool interplay between Paul and Denny on guitar, kind of like in the back, even if it was just Paul on guitar, maybe there was an overdub of a second guitar riff. Um, it, it just sounded, you could pay attention to what was being played a lot easier since they stripped off um, the, uh, the finish uh, that was on top orchestration. Uh, Jet. Technically they didn't really strip it off. It just hadn't been done yet. Right. It hadn't been put on there yet. Uh, the big difference for me, um, A, B, was Jet. Um, it was so much clearer. McCartney's drums are up front, very plain, nothing fancy, but they sound great. McCartney's drums on Jet. Um, you hear the backing vocals, uh, the ooh, 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 like they're sitting in the room with you. Mm -hmm. um, very present. Um, and uh, what else do I have right here? This is illegible. Uh, uh, and there's all like little nuances that are happening in the background that you kind of hear them on the finished mix. Uh, but they're a little clearer here that now that it's been, you're presented with the uh, underdub mix. Alan, you going to say something? No. Oh, okay. Hmm. Um, Bluebird's pretty straightforward. No horns, no saxophone on Bluebird. So you're really getting a true acoustic version without uh, any frills. Um, Mrs. Vanderbilt. Uh, little things like the goofy laughing and whatnot at the end are a little more prominent. Um, the ho, hey, ho are a bit subdued here in this earlier mix, probably brought up for the final mix a little more. Uh, 1985, obviously, the, it's the instrumental, barring the the uh, the oohs and ahs. Linda's keyboards really stand out on 1985, which is pleasant to hear. That, um, that's Paul, Darren. Uh, not piano. Uh, I'm assuming Linda's the one doing a... Yeah. Oh, that part. Okay, yeah. I mean, they're really up with the vocal not there and any orchestration or any other overdub put on there. You really hear all that. It's simple stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds great. It's like good for Linda. You know, it's out in the front there. Uh, Paul's playing the piano. Right. Yeah, that. No. Um, uh, let me roll it. I just put differently vocal. 
I hear a lot of differences in the vocal on Let Me Roll It, whether or not it was another take that was used or he redid the vocal, probably. Uh, and uh, Picasso's last words, a plane sounded like an early take. And just at the very end, it was interesting, you know, because Paul got accused of um, ripping off uh, African culture or going to Africa to try to rip off a little bit of African music and culture and take it, put it on, on a Wings record. And some of the vocalizations, uh, vocal, vocalizations at the end of Picasso's last words drew to me sound a little like Paul's mimicking some stuff. And I didn't say whether or not I've heard them on the finished mix, but they're very prominent towards the end of Picasso's last words drink to me. Uh, the vocalizations that end mimic African singing. Um, and Helen Wheels isn't here. Um, and that's basically it. I enjoyed it. It's a fun, different way of listening to Band on the Run. Mm -hmm. Even though I kept having to kind of go back and look, what am I listening to here? You're not listening to first takes. This is mixes done halfway through, for lack of a better way of putting it. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, as I said in an earlier show, we're, we're living in a time when people want to hear less production or stripped down versions. So this kind of fits the bill in a lot of ways. Um, I'll share my thoughts in just a few moments. Alan, what did you think of this release? The thing about the underdub mixes is, you know, they represent a specific moment in the production of Band on the Run. So basically these are all the takes they're not they're not uh they're not really early takes that were then replaced they're you know these are the works in progress right before the orchestral session um and for someone like me uh and you know and adrian and luca and people who do what we do this is absolutely fascinating um i i wish it was out when i was writing volume one um and you know we probably will end up making some revisions in in volume one if we have the opportunity to do so based on this you know not too many but there are a couple of things like the vocal on 1985 um listening to it track by track um i'm not going to go into each track <clears throat> but generally speaking, um, one of the things that impressed me is that without the orchestra and without the final mix, uh, it sounds a lot tougher. You know, it sounds a bit more like a rock band than the finished album does because the orchestral parts kind of mitigate some of that toughness. Also, mm. the different different ways of mixing you know you, you take a very sort of gritty guitar line and put it a little bit lower in the mix and you don't hear that grit anymore you hear the guitar line maybe but not you know that feeling so there's a lot of that in like for instance jet you know jet sounds a lot tougher to me than the finished mix um Plus, it's another one, like uh, Darren was mentioning, Linda synthesizers. The synthesizer bits in Jet um, were also a bit more present in this mix. Um, and so you could hear a lot of the things throughout that, uh, that Linda was doing um, that, you know, she was very proud of, actually. You know, she was beginning to get a sense of what makes a good effect, what what to do and when they met with Tony Visconti and he had some ideas about um <clears throat> to, what to do with bands on the run she she at one point said yeah you're not burying my synthesizer <laughs> you know so um so we know that you know these things meant something to her and and uh uh and you can you can see why they're sort of cool effects that she's getting and uh and they and they help the track and that's kind of the point right mm. uh let's see what else um yeah the lack of the vocal on 1985 lets you hear an awful lot because you know 
not that you don't necessarily hear, not that they've been mixed out necessarily in the finished version, but when there's a vocal there, you tend to focus on the vocal. I mean, just naturally. Mm -hmm. So now you're hearing it without, and there's a lot of stuff going on that you don't notice in the finished version. Um, and let's see. With, uh, you know, things like Let Me Roll It, my... My feeling was that the um, in the intro, the organ was a lot more present than in the final mix. But then I went back and listened to the final mix and thought, well, I mean, maybe it's not that much more present. I mean, the organ's right there, but somehow it felt felt more. Um, I don't know, overwhel not overwhelming isn't the right word, but you know. Um, and the same with question. Yeah. There is a, a sound towards the beginning of let me roll it. Hmm. Um, for lack of a better description, it sounds like a chicken. Yeah. Uh, to me, what is, like, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know what the sound of a chauffeur? <laughs> yeah. It was culture. That's what it sounds like. It goes, Ooh, you know, that real high. It's a sudden whoop. And it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, interesting, uh, Darren pointed out in uh, Picasso, the African chant kind of thing. Um, a lot of that is buried in the final mix. Um, you also hear it in the raw tape that's coming out on the bootleg. Um, even more clearly than on this October 14th mix. And the funny thing about that is that the reason they were recording at Ginger Studio is that the day before was the day when Fela Kuti came to EMI and accused Paul of coming to Africa to rip off the black man's music. And he said, no, 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 we didn't. We, that's not what we wanted to do. That's not why we're here. Blah, 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 blah. Ginger Baker came along and defused the situation. And so they felt, you know, okay, we should do something in Ginger's studio because Ginger thought they were going to be recording the whole thing at his studio um, because Paul's previous, Paul's manager, Frank Romeo had gone down to Lagos as sort of like an advanced reconnaissance theme uh, thing. And, and, and Ginger was left with the impression that Paul would be recording there. And he was quite upset that Paul wasn't. So after Ginger came and pretty much calmed Fela down, they went to Ark and recorded Picasso's last words. And suddenly for the first time in these sessions, we hear them doing something that is like the kind of stuff that Fela did and that kind of African chanting sort of thing. And I think it's really interesting that this takes place the day after he's accused of doing that when he hadn't yet done it and <laughs> he's saying he didn't want to do it. And, and it was kind of like his response is, yeah, well, now I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's funny. But I don't know why wow. they... They sort of ended up burying it, you know, more than uh, in this in this mix. You know, it's it's much clearer. Um, but yeah, you know, you you hear a, a lot of things going on in Picasso that <clears throat> that are sort of you know mixed in or mixed out or you know uh, hidden by the overdubs, and that's that's the case with a lot of these tracks. You know, I'm not sure that I would say that any of these tracks is preferable to the final version. I mean, it, it, they're, they're very clearly unfinished versions of these songs, but they show the process. They, they, they show, you know, okay, up to this point, this is where we were. And then between here and the next couple of weeks, we finish it off and it becomes the album, you know, so yeah, that's yeah I was going to say the same thing. I think it's fascinating to to witness the process of how Paul goes about making his recordings. And it just seems like as witness here on all these on all these tracks, all nine tracks, 
the drum parts are exactly the same as what's on the album. He lays that down and the rhythm parts. And then probably the last thing that he does or it tries to do would be the lead vocal or background vocals. That seems to be, and then or the orchestration <laughs> after all that, but just the basic tracks are done first. And um, it's still a fascinating thing to listen to, to me, when we first heard the song band on the run before this even came out, this underdub mix, I was thrilled because um right after the part where you hear uh, well the rain exploded with a mighty crash it's an entirely different lead vocal from paul and i was thinking the rest of the album was going to be like that well some of it is much of it isn't but it's very much like just hearing the band in the studio and nothing else and it's just interesting to know that even the vocal take on band on the run the new vocal he put on there he felt wasn't good enough so he had to redo it um, there's one point in Bed on the Run where I think it's Linda. It's probably Linda, but she starts to sing in a verse and it she came in too early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so they left the mistake in there. And I like when they do that. Um the few disappointing moments here are the songs where there's very little difference, like like Bluebird. It's basically the song without Howie Casey Sax solo. Right. Um and likewise with uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt, it's missing the sax part in there. It's very noticeable there. Um, so those two songs were kind of a disappointment. Jet is fun to listen to because it doesn't have the horns on there. So it's just the band. And it does have an edge of its own without having the horns, which I know are an important part of the, the overall arrangement of that song. It's part of the reason we've loved it. The saxes make a, a big difference there. Um, and it's a different vocal from Paul too. So that makes it even more special. Um, let me roll it is kind of interesting in a way because it sounds to me like the very first verse of let me roll it is a different vocal from Paul. Then the second verse of let me roll it is the one that they used in the album. Then the rest of it is all new vocals from Paul. So from that perspective alone, it made it more worthwhile to me. It's Paul with a great voice here doing a different take uh mamunia didn't really have much of a difference at all no words is interesting because the very beginning of it the guitars weren't double tracked yet and you don't have the orchestration at the very beginning which made a big difference and it's just the band mm -hmm. so it's you know it's just interesting to know what gets added later on, how much of a difference that makes in the overall recording. And it's nice to hear the song stripped down. 1985, you do have some of the guitar solo, which sounds like Paul to me at the very end of the song, which got a bit buried on the final mix with the orchestration. So it's nice to hear that a little bit clearer. Picasso's last words... The Denny Lane vocal at the very beginning is the same one that was used on the album, but Paul's vocals are different. And it doesn't have the clarinet part where they're doing the uh, that instrumental, which is kind of French sounding, that was taken out. Um, so again, it's a stripped down approach. You hear certain things that you never heard before. You know what it's like when it's just the band. And I could see myself going back to this every now and then. But I think based on the description of what Alan was saying about this new bootleg, I would have probably been a bit more interested in that than this. And when you think about the fact that, you know, he's got to have the original demos of Band on the Run <laughs> with Denny Seidel and Henry McCullough, um, I would have found that to be fascinating to see how different the original arrangements were to what became what what the final result was on the on the album when it came out but this is somewhere in the middle of all that and it's still a pleasant surprise and i'm glad that it came out but i still think there's so much more that could be done with ben on the run mm -hmm. yeah it's unlikely that he would put out the mixes on the bootleg um because they are so incomplete and in some cases so sort of messy i mean band on the run really is a mess and hmm. you can kind of see that it's just because you know he, 
there's no reason to assume anybody is ever going to hear this. And it's like, okay, you edit out these four bars and then you edit out this and then you overdub that. And, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's very primitive. Um, obviously needed a lot of work. I, I, I can see why Paul put this one out because it's really well along the way in the production, mm. but different enough to be kind of tantalizing but those early uh things from from the bootleg are uh are, are just way too much work in progress i i can't see him releasing that the demos we have no idea what they sound like other than that denny sywell says they sound better than the album <laughs> that's true or not you know i mean he's on it so he would have he would obviously feel close to those recordings um but love to hear that. That's what I really want to hear for Band on the Run now. Yeah, well, you you make you make a valid point there, Alan. Um, still, I think when you're putting out box sets of archival stuff, the people that are buying and spending the most money on this are not going to care whether these are primitive recordings or not. They're very interested in going deep into the songs, so you know it would suit their purposes but maybe Paul is a little too sensitive about that stuff going out. Mm -hmm. I would be. If it was my stuff, I wouldn't put those out. Happy to have them on the bootleg, but mm. um, but yeah, I, I could see how he wouldn't. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, that wraps things up for our look at the underdub mix of Ban on the Run. And before we go, let's... Uh, Go around the horn here and tell folks what we're doing. Darren? Yes. No, I'm kidding. What are you doing? Uh, I oh. wanted to pull up here um, the logo that I want people to look for that you'll see on our new Facebook page and explain to you again what's happening. Um, we have a new home on Facebook. The page is called... And it has a name, and it's right here. Things We Said Today video podcast. And for a visual, this is the logo you are looking for this. Okay, can you see that? Kind of, sort of. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is, that is what you'll see in our profile photo uh, on, the, on the new page. Again, called Things We Said Today. Uh, I wrote it in several places and, of course, can't find it now. Things We Said Today video podcast. S at some point soon, our other Facebook pages are going to disappear. We don't want to lose contact with them, anyone or at least as few as possible. So please go to the new page, click like or follow whatever button they give on the page, and we'll be there. And we're starting to eliminate new content on the old page. Uh, and the really old page I can't even get into myself. Uh, and eventually those older, uh, the presence on Facebook will be down to the one brand new one with the logo that I just showed you. So please join us there uh, in any event. If you want to find me individually, I have two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo and uh, another page, Darren DeVivo, WFEV DJ and Beatles podcaster. Um, so join me on those one or the other, and I'll invite you to, and we'll be all over the place. Uh, radio, WFUV, 90.7 FM in New York City. Uh, if you're not in the New York City metropolitan area, you can listen anywhere at WFUV.org. Uh, or you can get our app. You can listen on our app. Uh, and I can be heard Monday through Thursday night starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. But not this Easter weekend. We're recording this on uh, Wednesday, the 27th of March. And uh, I will not be on the air until next week, Tuesday. What is it? April uh, 4th, I think. No, third, second. Hi. Second. Second. At 10 p.m. Tuesday night, I'll be back after the Easter weekend off. So uh, I will see you on the radio then. And I'll see you here. And we got the new page. And next. There we go. We're going to end with Alan since he'll give you all the information about our show. So I'll <laughs> quick 
quickly say that if you go to my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio, I just did an interview with Luca Parassi, the author of this fine book on Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas, Volume 1. And um, he, do, he does have a new book coming out on Band on the Run in English in just a few weeks. Um, we talk about the album Press to Play, go through it in detail. We're going to do another show soon on Flowers in the Dirt and all the other stuff from the second half of the 80s from Paul, the Phil Ramone material, uh, the Russian album, David Foster songs. Uh, that'll be coming up soon. But go to Ken Michaels Radio for the new uh, show that we did with me and Luca Parasi. Talk More Talk, the other Beatles podcast uh, that I'm a part of with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. We just did a show on the Paula's Live album, which uh, were the songs from the 1993 New World Tour. Uh, we did our own review of that. Next Monday, uh, we're going to be doing a show on... Um, a countdown that Rob Sheffield did in Rolling Stone magazine of the top 100 solo Beatles songs. And so we're going to be talking about his choices. A lot of really unusual ones. I'm always happy to hear that instead of what you would expect to see at all times. Um, so we'll be talking about the top 100 as put together by Rob Sheffield in Rolling Stone. If you want to listen to my Beatles radio show, called Every Little Thing. The easiest way to do that is to go to WFDU's website. That's Fairly Dickinson University in New Jersey, WFDU.FM. Go to Archived Shows, type in Every Little Thing, and they have the last two shows of mine that aired on the radio station, and each show is available for uh, two weeks. And finally, my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Loads of audio interviews on there from people in the Beatle world, authors, musicians, podcasters, you name it. Um, and there's Beatles trivia contests every time you go there where you can win prizes like Beatle books, like the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. It's probably going to stay there until Volume 2 comes out. Um, so many great books, including uh, the new one on Mal Evans, Living the Beatles Legend uh, from Ken Womack. And that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And now I pass you over to Alan. Alan. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> um, yeah, you can find me on Facebook, uh, either just Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And um, there is also a McCartney Legacy Facebook page where we have links to amazon and possibly other places where you can pre-order volume two should you be so inclined which you know you should be um <clears throat> you can contact all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com um, you can also comment on the youtube uh you know page as comment section and we get an email about that if you comment so uh We'll see them. And you can follow us on Twitter, now called X, at things at things we said fab. Um, I still haven't started a threads page. I should do that. And uh, well, as Darren told you, our Facebook page is things we said today. Things we said today, video podcast. Podcast. Is the name of it. Okay. I forgot to mention one thing. I know recently Darren celebrated his 40th anniversary on WFUV. March 24th made my 42nd anniversary since I started doing Beatles shows on college radio on WNYT, New York Institute of Technology in Old Westbury, Long Island. So it's 42 years of loving doing that radio show, which is still on, like I said. Happy anniversary. Happy okay. anniversary. Thank you, guys. And thanks to all of you for watching. And we'll be back in two weeks, the week of April 8th. So, for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, I'm Ken Michaels, again, thanking all of you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.